Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk at the virtual Closure North 2020 conference. Uh, the talk is titled The Language of the Language, Comparing My Experiences of Compiler Construction in Closure and F Sharp. My name is Ramsey Nasser. Uh, these are the various places you can find me online. Uh, and I'm currently the CTO of Arcadia Technologies Incorporated, where we use Clojure to build tools for the video games industry. The background to this talk is that I've been working on two compilers for similar Lisps over the last few years. One compiler written in Clojure and the other written in F Sharp. And I wanted to share the differences in those experiences with you. The first of these two compilers is the Morgan and Grand Iron Clojure Compiler, or MAGIC. MAGIC is a compiler for Clojure written in Clojure targeting the C Sharp runtime. Uh, it produces MSIL bytecode, uh, MSIL standing for the Microsoft Intermediate Language which is the same thing that C-sharp compiles to. To break down its name, Morgan and Grand comes from the uh, intersection in Brooklyn uh, that was by the Kitchen Table Coder Studio where the compiler was originally developed. Iron is uh, a traditional name that's used for dynamic languages that run on the .NET platform. So there's an Iron Python and an Iron Ruby, and uh, this is an Iron closure. The primary motivations behind the compiler, uh, the reason we built it, um, was to support uh, another project, uh, a project called Arcadia. Uh, Arcadia is a free and open source uh, closure game development framework that runs in the industry standard Unity game engine. Unity is uh, one of the most popular engines uh, used in the video game industry today. Uh, and it's based on C Sharp, uh, which is where the interest in the C Sharp runtime comes from. Uh, Arcadia is a project that I developed uh, and continue to work on and maintain with my collaborator and business partner, Tim's Gardner, and we've been working on it since about 2014. Uh, and that open source technology is the basis of the uh, company that Tim's and I started together. Uh, the company shares in its name with, with the project. So uh, a compiler and a runtime for uh, a closure targeting the C-sharp environment exists. It's called Clojure CLR, and it's one of the official closures. It was, it's maintained by a man named David Miller, and he does, he does a very good job keeping that thing running. But over the course of the Arcadia project, we found that we just needed more control over the bytecode that our compiler was producing, both for performance reasons, but also in order to deal with uh, restrictive export platforms, specifically the iPhone. The other compiler I want to look at is for a language called Jin. Jin is a closure-like Lisp that I've been working on since about 2018, uh, and its compiler is written in F-sharp. It also targets the C-sharp runtime, so it produces MSIL bytecode, just like magic. Um, but I've been working on Jin as a personal project. Uh, the code is hosted in a private repository. And I did it mostly just to continue exploring compiler design, which is something that is just, just interests me personally, uh, and to learn F Sharp, which is a language I've been wanting to get into. Uh, it's not exactly like Clojure. Uh, it has some pretty serious differences, um, but those differences are not really the uh, point of this talk. Uh, getting into them is a little bit out of scope. So for, all, for the purposes of this talk, we could just pretend that it's basically a Clojure clone. Most importantly, Jin does have a really cool logo that I designed, uh, which is the most important part of uh, compiler construction, is making sure your language has a cool logo. Uh, and the logo like repeats really nicely, even in the terminal. So I have the vantage point of having worked on two compilers for two similar languages uh, in two very different implementation languages. And those are the experiences that I want to compare today. I want to focus on how Clojure turned out to be a surprisingly good language uh, for compiler construction. F Sharp is a member of the ML family of languages, which has a very long history of use in the compiler development community. So it'll come as no surprise that F Sharp is actually really good at building compilers. To do this comparison, I want to take three elements uh, common to both languages and compare them and their implementations in both compilers. So that's what the structure of the talk is going to be like. Uh, just a couple of caveats before I get into it. Um, first off, I'm much more experienced in Clojure than I am in F-sharp. Uh, you know, I've been doing Clojure for about six years now, and I run a Clojure company, and uh, Jin is my first real F-sharp project. So let that frame my uh, experiences. This is also, I mean, I'm talking about 
dynamic languages and static languages, and I don't intend this to score points in either direction in the so-called great debate between static types and dynamic types. Um, my experiences in both languages was extremely positive. I think the approaches offered by each language uh, each have their strengths and weaknesses. They offer different sets of trade-offs. Um, and I just don't think that sweeping general truths are what you're going to find when you're doing computer science, honestly. Uh, finally, I'm not interested in things that are possible or impossible in either one of these languages. Uh, Turing equivalence gives us the boring conclusion that anything you can do in one Turing equivalent system, you can do in another. So anything I can do in Clojure, strictly speaking, I can do in F sharp and vice versa. I'm much more interested in the subjective questions of what is idiomatic in a given language? What is straightforward in a given language? I think among other things, a programming language is an invitation to think in a particular way. So I want to look at the different ways you end up thinking about compiler development in Clojure and in F-sharp. So I like to start these talks with a crash course in compiler theory, because I know people generally aren't versed in this stuff, uh, and this tends to help the talk make a little bit more sense. So there are different ways to build a compiler, and what I'm describing here is just the approach that I take and the one that I've used in both the compilers we're going to be looking at. So each of these compilers is a functional transformation of source code to bytecode, and it proceeds through four broad phases, the first of which is a reader, uh, which takes your source text and produces S expressions. Magic uses the standard closure reader. It doesn't introduce anything new there. Uh, and in Jin, I wrote my own reader by hand uh, that, that does the same thing. The next step is something called an analyzer that takes your S expressions and turns them into an abstract syntax tree, or AST. We're going to be looking at ASTs a lot during this talk. This, the, the bulk of the, the work of the compiler really happens here. The AST captures the semantic meaning of your program. If the S expressions are what the programmer said, I like to think of the ASTs as what the programmer meant. The next phase is uh, something that I, in my compiler, is called the compiler, which might be a funny you know, name to give a subcomponent of your compiler. But the compiler takes an AST node and produces symbolic bytecode from it. Uh, symbolic bytecode is then fed to an emitter, which in turn produces the real bytecode. And the reason I introduce a step to produce symbolic bytecode before runnable bytecode is so that this whole pipeline can be functional down to the very end. And the conversion from symbolic bytecode to uh, real byte bytecode is a mechanical one. Nothing interesting happens there. Producing real bytecode generally means interacting with mutable APIs and things get a lot less functional. So I try and do as little heavy lifting in that world as possible. And this approach has proven effective. The first thing I want to look at is data representation and transformation. So the bulk of a compiler is transforming user code from one representation into another. And both f -sharp and Clojure encourage you to do this in totally different ways. So perhaps unsurprisingly, in f -sharp, it's all about types. Every stage of your data transformation is modeled as its own type. Pictured here is the AST type from the Jin compiler. And this kind of type in f -sharp is called a discriminated union. You can read the pipe symbol as an OR. So values that have the type AST can be a local OR, non-local, OR DO, OR DEF, and so on. Uh, each one of these is called a case. So the, the AST type is made up of a number of cases. So values in the AST type are constrained to be one of this finite set of cases. And modeling values this way as you know, one out of a finite set of things is a really nice middle ground I found between Java and C-sharp's approach to types and a Clojure's approach. So an instance of a Java type is exactly one thing. It has exactly one shape, which is described by its type. This is even true for interface types, right? Because an interface can give you different implementation, but the shape of the type, its uh, fields and its methods, is exactly one thing. So if you're consuming a sequence of Java or c -sharp types, you know that every element of that sequence is going to have exactly one shape. The other extreme is what we do in Clojure, which is hash maps. And the shape of a hash map is completely arbitrary. If you're consuming a sequence of hash maps, 
any one of them could contain any number of keys, right? There's no way to know statically. I find that discriminated unions fall in between the two, where it's not so constrained that everything has to be exactly one thing, and it's not so open that any value could be anything. We know that our values are going to be within this finite set of shapes that we've statically declared, and that turns out to be a really powerful modeling tool. It might be helpful to look at the internals of another compiler built along these ideas. Um, this is a screenshot from the documentation of the MLTON compiler. MLTON is a, an ML compiler written in ML uh, and sort of represents the direction that the GIN compiler is heading in. Uh, it's not, it hasn't quite gotten this far, uh, but I can definitely see the language nudging me in this direction. So MLTON has no fewer than eight intermediate languages. So these are intermediate representations of user code. And each intermediate language is its own type. It also has a number of analysis passes. And the job of each analysis pass is to take an instance of one intermediate language type and produce an instance of the next intermediate language type. So the whole compilation process can be thought of a sequence of transformations from one type to the next. And using this approach, you can enforce the progression of your compiler using the type system. So for example, the core ML language is converted into the XML language uh, by the defunctorize pass. XML here has nothing to do with the XML uh, data format. That's just a name collision. Um, core ML as a language has nested patterns. The type of the core ML intermediate language uh, has support for nested patterns, but XML does not. So part of what defunctorize has to do as a pass is figure out a way to flatten out the nested patterns in core ML into flat patterns in XML. And the type checker will help enforce this because you've encoded this transformation in the shape of the types. Jin is a much simpler language than ML uh, and will probably never have this many intermediate languages. Uh, it currently has two and it's probably gonna gain a third at some point, uh, but I definitely see F-sharp and the type-centric way of thinking pushing me in this direction to add more types in order to have a more refined transformation pipeline. In magic, it's basically the opposite story. Clojure prefers generic, open, flexible data to statically defined types. So the AST nodes in magic are all uh, nested hash maps and vectors. So this is what the AST for the expression stir2 looks like. Magic's analyzer is based on Nicola Mometo's tools analyzer library and uses the same hash map format. A few things to point out. Every AST node hash map has uh, two keywords that will always be there. The first is the op keyword, OP, uh, which is short for operation. This indicates the kind of AST node that that hash map represents. And it plays the role of the discriminated union label in the F-sharp AST. The other keyword that will always be there is the children keyword, and that indicates which other keywords in that hash map are nested AST nodes or vectors of nested AST nodes. Beyond that, the format is completely open, and different nodes will have different keys as they need them. Here, the outer node has an op of invoke because we were invoking a function. Invoke nodes have an FN key indicating what is being invoked, in this case, the FN is an AST node with an op of var describing the closure core stir var. Invoke nodes also have an args key, which is a vector of argument AST nodes. Uh, in this case, there's just one, which is a const describing the literal two. Uh, note that the const has literal val type keys and that the var AST node has assignable var meta keys and so on. So beyond op and children, all the keys in the node are specific to that node. And you don't really have a guarantee uh, as to what will be there in general. Instead of a pipeline that converts from type to type, Magic is a pipeline that progressively adds information to these hash maps before compiling them into bytecode. Not encoding this information in the type system gives us code that is both generic and local. For example, here's an abbreviated snippet of the logic that computes lexical closure information. The collect closed over star function walks the AST node and its children, collecting locals that were bound outside of this expression and storing them into the atom bound to the collects dynamic var. 
Once we've computed the information we want, we simply associate it onto the AST node in question. There's no need to update any types, which might be in separate files. There's no need to update any call sites or match expressions, which may be destructuring, and as a result might encode assumptions about the shapes of certain types. We run this pass against every node that we're compiling. If its op is in a set of keywords, here captured by collect closed over ops, then it gets a closed overs keyword. Otherwise, the pass is a no op and it doesn't get that keyword. Uh, if we ever decide down the line that a certain node should get closed over information, we just update the set in one place. There's no fussing with types. Uh, there's no jumping around between different files. This approach captures our intent very well in a way that's very generic and very local. Everything is happening in one place. To me, the ML approach feels like animating with keyframes, where the first thing you do is figure out what the major poses are going to be, and then the rest of your work is getting from one keyframe to the next. In this image, the three figures in black with the key label underneath them are the keyframes, and the red figures moving in between them are the in-between frames. In this approach, changing a keyframe is a big deal, and you have to redo the work at least leading up to it and following it. My apologies to any real animators if I got any of that wrong. On the other hand, Closure's approach to me feels like the game Katamari Damacy, if you've played it. Uh, it's a game about rolling around a ball of stuff, picking up more stuff as you go and making the ball bigger and bigger and bigger. The data flowing through magic feels like a big ball of stuff. Not a ball of mud like you get in object-oriented code where everything is interdependent on everything else and you're managing mutable state, but just a big ball of useful, discrete, inert stuff. It's safe to read from, it's safe to add to at any point in time, and that flows through your whole program. These are both very powerful approaches to modeling data and transformations. The rigor and guarantees that you get out of types are really wonderful, I enjoy them a lot. But the generic, reusable, localized code you get out of the closure approach is very powerful in its own right. The next thing I want to look at is the way symbolic bytecode is generated in both these compilers. Symbolic bytecode, again, is a functional representation of the bytecode of the target virtual machine. You could think of it by analogy as what hiccup is to HTML, symbolic bytecode is to real bytecode. As an example, I want to look at how Jin and Magic compile what's called an init obj expression. Init obj is a nice example of bytecode because it's compact. Uh, init obj is an opcode in the MSIL bytecode language. It's a feature associated with value types. And a value type on the CLR is a type that is passed by value, not by reference, and they're usually stack allocated. Uh, init obj is like a constructor, uh, but it takes no arguments and it only applies to value types. Every value type supports a zero arity constructor that basically gives you an instance of the type with all of its members set to zero. So for example here, vector three is a value type uh, the first line will generate a normal constructor call site, which uh, MSIL calls new obj. But the second line, because it takes no arguments, will give you an init obj. So I want to look at the parts of Jin and Magic that compile expressions like this. So the code on top is from Jin, and the code on the bottom is from Magic. And they both implement the same basic idea, which mimics what the c -sharp compiler does. And in order to emit an init obj expression, we have to first create a temporary local variable of the type in question. We load the variable's address onto the evaluation stack with uh, load loc a, that's load local address. We then use init obj to initialize uh, the instance and pop the value off the stack. And then we finally load the local itself onto the stack with load loc. The code is very similar in both examples. Jin takes the type as an argument because the destructuring happens uh, in a different place in the pipeline. Magic takes the AST itself and destructures it to get the type out, uh, but that's a minor difference. Uh, they have similar symbolic bytecode DSLs. Magix produces dynamic hash maps, but Jin's bytecode DSL is type safe. But the thing I want to point out is the type safety of Jin's bytecode DSL does not guarantee correct valid bytecode. For example, if I add a load loca instruction to load the local address twice, 
now the stack is imbalanced. Both of these snippets will compile, uh, the F sharp code will type check, and they will both produce invalid bytecode. And the only way to find that out is to run your compiled code through a verifier, which is an external program, or to try and run it in the VM and have it throw an exception. So this is a case where types will not save you, and that comes down to the fact that you cannot encode bytecode validity into the f -sharp type system. This stuff gets really complicated, especially when you get into tries and catch, uh, branching, conditionals, and all that kind of stuff. So the validity of bytecode is actually a very complicated thing to determine, and it just can't be captured by the semantics of the f -sharp type system. You, you can't uh, statically tell that the bytecode that you're producing is going to be valid. Uh, to put another way, if your compiler passes the type checker, that doesn't actually tell you anything about whether or not you wrote a correct compiler. So the result was that for me, this part of the compiler feels very similar in both languages. Uh, generating symbolic bytecode isn't really any different given the presence or absence of types. Uh, the focus here is on testing uh, iterating, investigating uh, problems, uh, investigating problematic expressions that don't compile correctly. Uh, and Clojure's REPL is, is invaluable here to be able to run experiments and, and track down problems, but uh, types don't really have anything to say about it. The last thing I want to look at are situations where the exact bytecode an expression compiles to depends on expressions that contain it. In some cases, the expression itself is not enough to determine the bytecode to produce, but we need more context. An illustrative example is locals. Here's a let expression binding locals z and a to 80 and 9, respectively, and then using a and z in an addition expression in the let body. The resulting bytecode is below. On the CLR, every method gets a heterogeneous store of its locals. Uh, it's not quite an array, it's more like a typed tuple or a struct, but every local is referred to by its offset. So here z becomes local 0, a becomes local 1. Uh, you can see them highlighted in the disassembly um, along with their type. If there were other expressions that introduced locals before this expression in the resulting method, then the numbers of these locals might be different. To compile the binding vector of a let, uh, we have to compile each expression in turn and then store the result into the relevant local with stlock, which is short for store local. So first we load the constant integer 80 onto the evaluation stack at IL0, and then we store it into local 0 in IL2. That's the equivalent of binding z to 80. Similarly, we load the integer constant 9 onto the evaluation stack at IL3, and then we store that value into local 1 at IL5 and that's the equivalent of binding a to 9. Now, anywhere in the body of this let, to compile a local, we have to know which offsets to use. To compile plus a z, we have to load the values of a and z onto the evaluation stack and add them. In the bytecode starting at IL6, we load local 1 to the stack, then load local 0 to the stack, and then add them in IL8. As we recurse down the AST compiling expressions, we have to remember that A is local 1 and Z is local 0. The bytecode we produce for a local expression depends on the let expression that contains it. Local Z and A in a different let expression would result in different bytecode, possibly using different offsets. Um, the exact same let expression moved into a different function might actually result in different offsets. Uh, so the, the final bytecode that we produce is a function of both the AST, and some extra context information. Locals are one example of this, but there are others in the compilers, uh, for example, recur expressions. So that's a description of the problem. Let's look at the kinds of solutions you might get in f -sharp and Enclosure. So in Jin, unsurprisingly, the answer is you just make a type. So there is a context record that keeps track of any extra contextual information that compilation might need, and this is threaded through the whole compilation process. So locals are one member of this record, and uh, they're represented as a dictionary of AST nodes, which in practice are always locals, that maps to variable definitions. A variable definition here comes from the monocessa library that I use to generate bytecode in Jin. Um, the API is a high level enough that we don't actually have to compute the offsets ourselves. Uh, and the variable definition instance is something that gets compiled into an offset.
for us. Uh, but we do have to make sure that we use the same variable definitions when compiling binding vectors and when compiling local expressions. So we thread this dictionary through the compilation process, and the idea is that a let expression would populate it as part of the process of compiling the binding vector and then pass that down into its body. And when we encounter a local, it tries to look itself up in that dictionary. And if it finds an entry, if it finds a variable definition, it compiles to an LD lock, a load local, which is what we saw on the previous slide, uh, of that variable definition, and this will compile down into the correct offset. And if it can't find itself in the dictionary, it, it signals an error. Another thing that's evident from the snippet is that there's other context information in this record. Uh, as of the time of this writing, it also maintains the parameters of the function that it's in for argument lookup, uh, and it keeps track of information on recur. Uh, the idea is that as more extra compiler context is found to be needed, this type would grow. And we just keep adding stuff to this type uh, as we needed more information down the line. So encouraged by Clojure's idioms, uh, I went down a totally different path in magic. Uh, and I ended up with a totally different system that is uh, simpler and more general than what I was able to do in F Sharp. The basic idea is that compilation in magic is controlled by compiler maps. A compiler map uh, maps AST op keywords to compiler functions. This is the compiler map that magic starts out with, and it serves as an example of how this thing is shaped and how it looks. So what it's saying is to compile a const AST node, use the const compiler function. To compile a do AST node, use the do compiler, and so on. There are many more entries to this map uh, that I left off this slide to save space. This map is threaded through the compilation process. So every compiler function gets an AST node and a map that is shaped like this. Most expressions don't touch the map, they just pass it down to their children if they have any. But things get interesting when we need to maintain context, like in let and its locals. So this is an abbreviated snippet of the let compiler in magic. To start, we compute a binding map, a map of local names to bytecode locals. The implementation is left out to save space, but this plays the same role as the locals dictionary in the F sharp example. Uh, something to note is that a previous analysis pass will have already assigned unique names to all of the local bindings uh, before any of this happens. So mapping by name here is actually safe. The same map is used to compile the binding vector, which is the stlock bit at the bottom. And it's also used to look up the locals inside of this let local compiler function in the middle. Let local compiler is a bespoke compiler function for the locals of a single let binding. Every let binding gets its own local compiler function. Uh, and it's notable here that it closes over the binding map that was used to compile the binding vector. This plays a similar job of the local compiler function in Jin that we saw in a, a few slides ago, uh, except that there is, in fact, in Magic, there isn't a global local compiler function. Every let expression produces its own bespoke, lexically closed compiler function for its locals that it passes down into its body. In order for locals in the body of this let to use the let local compiler function, we merge it into the incoming compilers map uh, represented by the compiler's argument here with the key local, replacing whatever was there with this new function. Note that this implementation doesn't actually uh, throw an exception if a local can't find itself in a map. It just recurses upwards by calling compile with the compiler map that was passed into the let expression. And that's how we implement nested let expressions. So at this point, specialized compilers is a compiler map that contains everything that was passed into the let compiler with the local key changed to map to a bespoke local compiler function that connects the bytecode local variables that were used to compile the binding vector of this let expression to the locals that might appear in its body. Specialized compilers is also used when compiling the bindings, and this is how we support uh, binding expressions referring to previous binding expressions. By using map merge semantics like this, what we're saying is anywhere in the body of this let expression or in any of its bindings, if you encounter an expression that is a local, use this function that we just created that was customized for this particular let expression. If it's not a local, compile is normal. 
This is a really powerful approach to solving this problem that is rooted in Clojure's view of the world as just data and functions. It really has nothing to do with let or local specifically. It's just a way to, it's just a way to dynamically intervene on the dispatch of the compiler at any point in the compilation process with arbitrary code. Uh, we could put anything in these functions. And I use this technique all over the compiler. This is how recur is implemented. Uh, this is even how tricky things like the special this inside of proxies is implemented. It needs to know to load argument zero, which is the this pointer, and that doesn't really happen anywhere else in the language. Uh, this is how fields and setbang in def type is implemented. This is how self-referential constructors in def type are implemented, and it, uh, this approach helped me get around quirks of the emission library that Magic uses. It's a powerful, reusable approach to solving this whole class of problems that basically falls right out of Clojure's idioms. Um, in f -sharp, I just wouldn't even think to do something like this. I would just write types the way I showed you in the previous slides um, and, and just kept building up context in, in that way. And that's an okay approach, right? That has its benefits as well. But um, coming at this problem this way in Clojure has really paid off in the long run. So wrapping up, uh, I guess I want to end on the thought that I think that what Clojure and F-Sharp have in common is actually much, much bigger and much more important than uh, what differentiates them. They're both deeply functional languages, and functional programming really is just the way to go to manage a complex system like a compiler. I think as long as you can model your system as a functional pipeline, you're probably going to be okay. And whether it's typed or dynamic, you're making trade-offs within a winning strategy. Uh, I've hacked on object-oriented compilers that are you know, deeply committed to inheritance and, and mutability, and it's, it's no fun. It's so difficult to reason about. It's so difficult to even know where to like begin to think of making changes. Um, it's just not a, not a good scene. So as long as you're doing functional programming, you're in good company and you're probably going to be okay. That's all I got. Uh, I hope that was interesting and uh, coherent and helpful. Uh, if you're interested in following along with Magic, this is where it can be found online. Uh, Jin, as I said earlier, is in a private repository. I'll probably open source it at some point, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that on Twitter when I do. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't see anyone in person this year. I really love Closure North, and uh, hopefully next year uh, things will be in a state where we can all hang out together face-to-face -to -face again. Uh, but until then, stay safe out there, everyone. Thanks for listening.